So I was in the recon in Lebanon. So the first time you're in combat, it's, it's of course very scary and everything. You don't know what to expect. Welcome to another video. Today I invited a special guest, my former instructor here with me. Hi guys, uh, my name is Tomer Israeli and I, uh, the owner, the head of school of Israeli Tactical School. We are located in the United States, operate from uh, several locations with focus on Florida. In my background, just briefly, uh, I was a Shin Bet or Israeli Secret Service officer, served in the embassy of uh, Israel in Washington, D.C. as a deputy. Uh, the focus of the mission, of the, my diplomatic mission was to secure the ambassador and the diplomat uh, mission, diplomats uh, coming to the United States and traveling in the United States. Um, so this is what I did in the embassy. In my uh, background in the army, I was a team leader in the recon, uh, meaning uh, participating in the war in Lebanon um, as a reserve uh, officer, captain. And uh, I started the, my service in Seret Matkal. Seret Matkal is the Israeli Delta Force. So challenges could be just the service itself, you know, you need uh, to train a lot, you need to be in shape. And if you are um, not lucky, you may uh, find yourself in combat. And then you see how all the training, uh, basically uh, all the training that you did and being prepared is uh, paying off. So I think this is the biggest challenge is to maintain a readiness and as a team leader, as an officer, also to make sure that your team is ready. So highly motivated, know how to work together with all the difficulties that everybody have in life, nothing to do with anything. So I think this is the biggest challenge as a, as a leader. And the biggest thing to get accepted to Seret Matkal, to the Delta Force, is to get accepted. Uh, you are in competition with, uh, in my times, now maybe it's a bit different. The competition was uh, 20,000 people competing for 25 spots in the unit. So to, to be able to be filtered in, in, with this competition is relatively hard. Also, I was uh, only in high school before, and so I had no experience really with the army or what they really need. So just playing basketball and, you know, do what teenagers do. Uh, but Israel is a very special place when, uh, when it comes to the army service. Everybody goes to the army. So, uh, of course, I knew what, the, what type of training I need to do in order to be accepted. So I took it very seriously, uh, the training, uh, and I made it. I made it in. After, after get accepted to the unit, the, it's a long journey to become a warrior in the unit, and etc. But it's not uh, significantly harder than other units. So basically, mm -hmm. you need to go through infantry training and all kinds of training that to prepare you to be a warrior in the unit. Uh, so I don't think it's significantly different between the units as much. So I was in the recon in Lebanon. I was also as a soldier, as a commander, uh, not in the recon, in more like infantry type of uh, operations. It's uh, nothing is classified really. It's a, a war against guerrilla fighters try to attack you. Uh, you are the big, the big, uh, big army, relatively clumsy and predictable, because uh, you have the the need to move in long convoys, motorcades inside the rocky terrain area, mountain mountains area of Lebanon. You like a sitting duck, and what guerrilla fighters do? They uh, don't try to win you; they try to hurt you like uh, a hit and run uh, tactics 
אינסייד לבנון, the challenge is to, to get, uh, to ambush the guerrilla fighters. So basically to do like infantry patrols, mostly at night. So all the idea of uh, fighting at night is very important. Yeah. In the mountains, basically where uh, uh, we are limited with our observation. When you uh, uh, sit on a mountain and observe the area around you, uh, you can see stuff, but you can, there are also places that are not, uh, not uh, you don't have visual uh, to, to these areas because of the way the topography is shaped. Some of the things you see, some things you cannot see, we will go at night, and in these places we set up ambush that basically, uh, if the guerrilla fighters try to, to get close to us, we'll be able to engage them. And we do it almost every night. So you basically, you live your life like, a, like, like an animal in the forest, and basically camping with camouflage and all the stuff that we're using in order to, to be hidden during the day. So it's a hard walk, very physical. You climb mountains, you go, in, you go with the relatively heavy loads. The biggest thing, the biggest challenge in combat is the fog of war, basically the uncertainty of, of the combat. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't know who is shooting you from and you don't know the big picture. And basically uh, what we teach also in the school, the tactics gives you ability to engage with the enemy, but also understand what is the, the enemy is all about, what is the, what he's actually doing. Uh, so, so the biggest thing is the uncertainty and applying the tactics and start to, and start to work according to the rules. So the first time you're in combat, it's, it's of course very scary and everything, but um, you don't know what to expect. For the second time you're in, in combat, or third time, it becomes more, more clear what to do, and, uh, and you start to feel confident and more capable. From here, it's muscle memory. It's more what you did in training for, for many, uh, many hours a day and for weeks and months. You know how to operate eventually as a team, and... It's, of course, very dangerous and, and all of that, but uh, very scary anyway. But uh, you have confidence in yourself and in your team. And this is, I think, an uh, interesting angle about combat because uh, um, I think it's, important, uh, it's an important maybe topic because most people train and never get to be in combat ever. I remember these times that when as a soldier, as an officer, I did this uh, operation, I felt a big achievement just to the hard work that you put and it gives you lots of uh, uh, good feeling that you worked hard, you know. It was really rewarding feeling uh, to do that. I remember as a relatively young soldiers, as I mentioned before, uh, after basically teenager to become a soldier, it's like my first job is to be in the army. It depends on your assignment and depends on your unit. Chimbet, it's a big organization. Most mm-hmm. of the organization is dealing with counter terror when on the side of the intelligence. Mm-hmm. I was on security. So, and now Chimbet, Chimbet, it's different. Chimbet, I was an officer already in the army. Mm-hmm. So I got selected because of that. So it was relatively easy to get filter in. The course is very hard. The course, I did the course when I, uh, my age was 34, relatively old compared to, to the other, uh, other students in the course were 25 years old, uh, 10, dif- 10 years difference. So physically it was a challenge. You train 12 hours a day, uh, three hours of Krav Maga, shooting tactics every day, every day for three months. So it was physically challenging. You don't need to be Superman to, to finish. First of all, formally, nobody knows yet because uh, we are now in war. There were no structure, organized investigations mm. to really what happened that day. And maybe my perspective is wrong. In a simple way, what is... Uh, totally clear that we were surprised. Mm. We did not foresee the attack, although the indications, meaning we receive indications, substantial indications, that from some reason 
did not translate to action of actually being prepared for this indication. So, so basically, the philosophy of being ready is once you know the enemy capabilities, okay, what he is what is capable of doing. Okay, mm. this is capabilities. This is one thing. The other thing is intentions. Does the enemy is willing to use his capabilities? Okay? The gap between intentions and capabilities is uh, what makes or break your ability to being prepared. If you decide that 100% intentions exist always, if you think that the enemy is capable and willing at the same time, you will be able to set your forces ready for this action. If you think it's have capabilities but have no will, you will do nothing to prepare, minimal to prepare for this, uh, his abilities. You will be surprised if he does it when you're not expecting it. This element of surprise is the most important component in war. So what they did, they've been able to uh, trick us to feel that uh, although their abilities are very high, their intentions are very low, and we fell for it, and therefore we were surprised. So the forces that were on the border were outnumbered to the amount of uh, uh, enemy that was uh, overrun them. Uh, when you fight 3,000, they, they assume that there were between 2,000 to 3,000 uh, enemy soldiers in that attack. I assume all in all combat warriors, okay, not people that are doing uh, logistics, okay, around 150. Mm. So right. 3,000 compared to 150, we were focusing on the wrong things. Absolutely complacency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not prepared, and this is the, the source. The source of the problem is when you don't believe the enemy will attack you, mm-hmm. or when you underestimate the enemy, abilities and intentions, you suffer. What I want to add here, it's very important to understand that now Hamas failed understanding our intentions. So basically what Hamas did significantly pissed us off, Mm-hmm. In, a, in a great way, and like no other uh, uh, situation I remember ever in history. And now they, they will face 100% from the abilities of the Israeli army to crush them. I'm a mainstream guy, okay? Even the most average person in Israel and the most peaceful one wants to crush Hamas all the way. Mm-hmm. Meaning there's no right and left, there are no opinions. Everybody's united in Israel to, to simply eliminate Hamas from planet Earth. Now we don't have right and left. Everybody's very, very clearly supporting these actions now. Better for them to surrender because we're not going to stop. Hamas did a war, a crime against humanity. In so many ways, that if you want, uh, I think everybody knows now. Yes, uh, the biggest problem of the tunnels is that uh, um, we have hostages inside. Mm. We have 200 and something, around 240 uh, hostages held probably in the tunnel, so... We cannot really destroy the, the most meaningful tunnels. We can uh, destroy the local ones, the one that the, the guerrilla fighter are using to hide, to hit and run. Mm. So basically they're coming out, shoot a rocket or shoot something and then going back to the, to the tunnel. So these, these we, we can destroy, but the main one, the one that Hamas is using to basically to, to hide from the bombings from uh, the aircraft, mm. These are very, very, very hard uh, to destroy because of the hostages inside. If mm. they were not inside, we're simply going to collapse them on their heads. Mm. And there is a, a way to do it, ways to do it. Uh, some of them are uh, very old ideas like water. We can pump mm. 
פעם ווטר, you know, water will go down and, and flood the tunnels. Therefore, the strategy of the Israeli IDF, the, the Israeli state, is uh, to basically to choke them, to put them in a siege situation, and until they will have no choice but to surrender, and then we negotiate also the release of the hostages. The IDF uh, doesn't send the soldier to the tunnels because uh, mm. there are many tunnels over there. The tunnels with hundreds of kilometers. Mm. So you can uh, try to, to find the uh, hostages in this condition. It's, uh, it's not uh, realistically. Uh, unless you have intelligence and the intelligence is uh, coming from, like you mentioned before, different resources. But uh, this information has to be valid. It doesn't have to, just to get information is not enough. You need to make sure that this uh, information is reliable and, and then you can do planning. And inside the tunnel, it's very difficult to do. So this is a very good question, but it's not really the question that the army should answer. The state of Israel needs to decide what they want to do. Uh, from the army standpoint, mm. the army needs uh, freedom to walk, and therefore Gaza cannot go back to where, where it was. Mm. Yep. Meaning the ability to go in and out, arrest whoever you want to arrest. It doesn't necessarily need to say that we're going to be there all the time, but we want to be able to do it if we want to. And this is very important. Without that, it will simply go back to where it was. So first of all, Iran could, could send missiles. They have mm. the ability to do that. Mm. But they currently don't have the will. They have the ability, but they don't have the will. And the reason is because they got closer. To, Iran is 2,000 kilometers from Israel. And so what they do is they're coming closer to the border with Israel using organizations like Hamas mm-hmm. and Jihad Islamic, that they are basically a proxy mm-hmm. uh, yeah. militia that they operate. So this, look, Hamas is basically Iran, Iran forces. They call themselves Palestinians and they call themselves Hamas, but they are serving the big master, Iran. So this is why Iran doesn't need to get dirty doing the job. Mm-hmm. They're simply paying someone else to do the job. And this is very convenient for them because they have peace of mind while uh, everybody else is suffer. Uh, Fauda is based on Shin Bet and on Dudevan, the cover unit. So they are mixing two ideas together and doing kind of a Hollywood salad mm-hmm. from all of what's really happening. Uh, you see Lior, that is the head is basically the main character in Fauda. He's like, he's a one-man show, a human operator and a warrior and intelligence officer. And he's, he's basically all around James Bond that did not really exist in real life. In real life, uh, Lior is three people or four people, or maybe even three to four organization in the organization. So this is a bit not realistic. What is realistic about it is the problem, the conflict. You see that the Arabic people are normal people also, and they have family, and they have ambitions in life, and they have kids, and they are weak and strong like like the Israelis. So basically everybody, what I like about Fauda, that it shows you the reality of life and the reality of the conflict and the problems. Liberty ship, it's basically intelligence uh, ship that was uh, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, and they were listening to signal, uh, mm. signal uh, intelligence coming from Israel. Mm. And for some reason, we decided to sink that ship mm. uh, back in the day. Uh, big mistake. And big mistake by Israel, okay? And also... I think that America, America also learned the lesson, and uh, it's now we are uh, 60 years after. Okay, so something like 60 years. So, so basically, America now, as you see, is uh, 
the strongest ally of Israel and vice versa. I'm very grateful that you give me the opportunity to talk about the side of Israel and to do some advertisement to the Israel Tactical School Operation. If you enjoyed my video, do consider subscribing to my channel. La 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 la.